What is up guys, Karma Medic here, and welcome back to another Dose. If you guys don't know who I am, my name is Nasser. I'm a second year medical student at King's College London, and I make these YouTube videos to help you guys with anything medical school related. Today, I'm gonna be going through section one of the BMAP, the critical thinking and problem solving section. We're gonna start with a couple of general tips on the section, and then we'll jump straight into solving questions live on camera so that you guys can see my thought process for each question and see how I solve it. If you guys wanna see more videos like this where I go through different sections of the BMAP, make sure you leave a like on this video and subscribe to my channel so that you know when those videos are released. Before we begin, I want to say thank you to Medify for sponsoring this video. When I did a similar series on the UK cat over the summer, a lot of students told me they didn't want me to use the official UK cat resources because they wanted to save those resources for themselves when they were practicing for the exam. So I've listened to you guys and I'm going to be using Medify's question bank for this video and you guys can use the official BMAP pass papers for your own revision. If you guys want to check out Medify, I'll leave links in the description. You can go see their website. They offer a range of courses for the UK CAT, the BMAT, and personal statements. Okay, so first things first, general tips. So section one is all about critical thinking and good problem solving skills. The first thing that I'll say is that you don't need any prior knowledge to solve this part of the exam. You just need to go in, know how to analyze data and come to conclusions. Number two, if you're stuck on any given question and you're spending anywhere over that amount of time, just guess, mark it and move on. You can always come back to it later and see if you can give it another go. But if you're getting stuck on a question, definitely move on. It's not worth wasting your time. The third thing is that all questions in section one are worth the exact same amount. So you want to do as many easy questions as possible, the questions that you know you can actually answer, and then come back to the more difficult ones later. The fourth thing is that you need to learn to read quickly. You're going to have to quickly read a passage that might be either short or long, and you want to take out the key points, the main conclusions out of that so that you can answer the questions efficiently. So improving your reading skills will definitely be something useful here. The fifth thing is that it's really important to know what the question is asking of you. Under the critical thinking heading, there's going to be lots of different questions that can be asked. For example, what are the main conclusions of this passage? Which of these statements, if true, would either weaken or strengthen the argument of the passage? Which of these statements would be the biggest flaw for the passage? Things like that. So you wanna make sure you know what the different question types are so that you know what it is that you're doing in order to answer those questions. And lastly, you are not allowed to use a calendar. <laughs> and lastly, you are not allowed to use a calculator. So do not practice with a calculator. Do not have a cheeky little calculator on the side while you're doing these questions. Throw your calculator away in your drawer and just focus on using mental maths and a pen and paper to solve the math related questions. Being able to round up or down and guesstimate the answer is going to be very important in being able to do these questions quickly. So definitely brush up on your mental maths. Obviously, this will also be important in the physics section in section two. All right, enough about general tips. Let's jump straight into the questions. All right, guys, so here I am on Medified's BMAT question bank. I'm going to start by solving the problem solving questions and then I'll move on to critical thinking questions. So for problem solving, let's get started. I've also got a pen and paper here with me in case I need to write anything down. And of course, I suggest that you guys do the same. Okay, so question one, a group of friends hire out a Spanish villa, they split the cost of the villa between them contributing 26 pounds each. If there had been six more friends sharing the cost of the villa, each person would have to contribute 16.25. How many friends hire out the villa together originally? So a group of friends, let's call them x split the cost of the bill between them contributing 26 each. So some total number divided by a group of friends x is equal to 26. Okay. Now, if there had been six more friends sharing the cost of the bill, each person would have had to contribute this. So we have another equation that says some total number, uh, we're going to call it y. Now we have the same total number y again, over x plus six is equal to 16.25. So now let's solve these two equations. We have y equals 26x on the left side and y equals 16.25x plus six times 16.25 plus 97.5. So now we know that y equals 26x on the left. We'll plug that y into the equation y on the right. So what we end up with as our total equation is 26x equals 16.25x plus 97.5. If we solve that for x, we get 10 friends. Okay, awesome. Next question. Whoa. Okay, so this is a lot of information. I'm first going to read the possible arguments that could be can be concluded and then the information. I would usually do this the other way around, but because there's so much information here, I'm gonna do that first. For Canada, there appears to be an increase in the rate of publication from year 2000, whilst that from Australia slows from the year 2004. So Canada increase from 2000. 2000, which one of these is Canada blue? Canada, an increase, okay, true. Whilst from Australia, there's a slow from 2004, 2004, Australia, 
there is not a slow here. So one is definitely false. Two, whilst the rate of US publications increased between 1990 and 2005, 1990, 2005, USA increased, true. The share of US publications relative to the world total decreased over this period. Mm, okay, I would say that that's probably true because all of the other ones are increasing as well. So that's probably true. So too true. For both Australia and the US, there was a higher than trend number of applications in 2002, followed by a drop in 2003. US and Australia in 2002. Okay, there was a higher than expected from the trend. Okay, that's true here. Sorry, that was Canada. Okay, that's true here. And for the US, that's true as well. Followed by a drop in 2003. I agree with that. Okay, so I agree with two and three options two and three only. Okay, so I got it right. So this is a really important lesson. As you guys can see, there is so much information here. This is all way too much information. And if you actually sat down to read that you would be here forever. So I just skipped all this and went straight to the conclusions. I realized from the conclusions that I only need to look at the graph. And that's how I managed to save time on this question and only read what's relevant. So make a judgment. If you guys think the paragraph is really small, maybe you can skim through it and then jump to the conclusions. But for something like this, I think the best strategy was definitely to go for reading the conclusions first and then getting the relevant material from the text. And my map is about to die, so let's plug that in. Stay alive. We have a lot of questions to do. All right, next question. Again, there's quite a lot of information. I'm gonna to skip to what the question is asking for and then work backwards. So on the basis of the above data, which of the following is a reliable conclusion? Generally, the older a woman suffering from cervical cancer, the higher the likelihood she will die from cervical cancer in the UK. New cases, deaths, age group. So are there more deaths per 100,000 um, the older you get? That definitely seems to be the case. So that sounds good. Let's take a look at the other ones. If a woman between the ages of 50 and 64, so here and here, undertakes screening for cervical cancer, she reduces her risk of cervical cancer. Where do we talk about that? So although cervical cancer screening program, we start for women who have not been screened between 50 and 64, the 20 year risk rises a lot, okay? But that doesn't mean that if uh, you do get screened, it reduces the risk. So it's kind of similar, but not exactly the same. In the UK, there were a greater number of women aged 50 to 54 than women aged 45 to 49 in the 20, in the 2009, 2011 period. 2009, 2011, I don't think we can tell that from this graph. This isn't about total population. This is about cases of cervical cancer. A woman under the age of 15 cannot have cervical cancer. Um, well, over here, it shows that no one under the age of 15 in this period did have cervical cancer, but that doesn't mean that it's not possible. So I'm gonna go with A, the original answer that we chose. Awesome, okay. So yeah, we eliminated all of the other answers because they simply weren't true, and A is the best one. Okay, what is the total number of squares in the above shape? Oh, okay. That's interesting. Let's start keeping a tally. So let's start with all the biggest ones and work down towards smaller ones. So biggest one, one, okay. Then two, then three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. Then 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20, okay, clearly there's some more hidden <laughs> squares in this shape. 21, 22, 23, 24, and then I don't know if I'm gonna find a 25th somewhere, so I'm gonna go with 24. Oh, awesome, okay, <laughs> I'm so happy I got that right. I was gonna feel really uh, tricked if I didn't get all those, all those squares, okay. Next question. The table below shows the annual complication rate following cannula insertion across six surgical wards in this hospital over three years. What is the correct order in terms of lowest to highest increase between 2014 to 2015? Lowest increase. So we have two, three, seven, one. So this might be first, eight, six, and oh, oh that's the total. So where's the one? So O copy is first. So I'm gonna put O then. So we immediately eliminate B and C. Then after that, what do we need to decide between? Q, W, W. So Q was six and W was two. So the next biggest increase is W. So it's one of these two. Then we need to decide between G and Q. We already know Q is six. So G is three. So we know G is next. So it's D. So 
Another way to really quickly save time and fly through these kinds of questions is that you don't want to first look at all the differences and then try and rearrange them in order and look at what comes first, what comes second, what comes third. You wanna use the answers to help you narrow down the paths that you wanna look at. We just look at the answers and we know the first decision we have to make is between Okapi, um, which are these three, and Wallaby. Once we make that decision, from the answers, the only next things we can choose are Qual or Wallaby. So we need to decide either Qual or Wallaby comes next. Then once we've decided it's Okapi followed by Wallaby, we just need to decide between Galago and Qual. That means we never even looked at Emu, we never even looked at Lemur, and we saved so many comparisons in the middle. So make sure you guys use the answers to help you narrow down what information you're looking for in the question. My alarm clock is a 24 hour digital clock, so that for instance, 214 appears as this, okay. One morning I woke up and knocked my alarm clock onto the floor and saw that. I panicked, thinking I'd overslept, I realized looking at the clock upside down, it was only 11 minutes past five. Now, which one of the following times would the display appear the same, whichever way up I saw the clock? 5.51 a.m. would be 05.51, so if you turn that around, that's not the same. 5.51 p.m. would be 17.51, so no. 1.01 a.m. would be 01.01, which around would be 10.10, so no. 3.21 p.m. would be 1.521, uh, upside down would be 1.251, almost. 3.51 p.m. would be 15.51, which upside down would be 15.51, so it's E. So just write out each one of these alarm clocks the right side up and then flip your piece of paper upside down to see what it would look like upside down. Awesome. Next question. Okay, I think that's enough for the problem solving questions. I'm now gonna move on to the critical thinking questions and see what we can do there. Critical thinking questions, I actually find these a little bit easier because I find them more like the VR section on the UK CAT. So let's take a look at a couple of them. Requiring assessment of environmental impact. Which of the following is a conclusion that can be drawn? Companies are free to choose whether they adopt bottom line accounting. Doesn't sound like it because it says now they're required. They need to have a positive social and environmental impact can adversely affect financial success. Okay, potentially. According to triple bottom line accounting, a successful company would, buy fi would be financially, environmentally, and socially successful. This sounds correct. Includes environmental and social factors along with economic. Okay, so in order to have that, you would have to be successful in all those, okay? Triple bottom line considers the three variables, people, planet, profit, in decreasing order of importance. We definitely can't decide that. I'm gonna go with C. Awesome. Next question. The newborn babies who are fed with more detrimental to babies. Which of the following, if true, most weakens the above argument? So the above argument is saying baby formula should be banned. So something that would weaken that is something that shows baby formulas are actually good. So SIDS constitutes only of 0.9 infant deaths. Okay, there are various baby formula mixes suitable for specific stages of baby development. That'd be good. Taurine amino acid is available in various baby formula mixes. That would help weaken the, the last part of this argument, but not the full part of the, this paragraph's argument. Health benefits of breast milk depend directly on mother's nutrition. That's also not bad. 20% of young mothers are unable to produce milk, breast milk. Ooh, that's good too. Okay, so B, D, and E seem like decent answers to this question. So let's find out what the core conclusion of the top paragraph is because that's the one that we want to weaken the most so newborn babies are more frequently prone to SIDS the statistical analysis shows that if fed solely breast milk a lot of deaths would be prevented a vitally important feature is those concepts are dynamically and precisely formulated in direct proportion to the development as per needs of the baby so B directly tackles this part of the thing D kind of attacks the whole argument that health benefits of breast milk depend directly on mother's nutrition, which could vary. And then E, 20% of young mothers aren't even able to produce breast milk. I think this might be the most because they're saying that if fed solely breast milk instead of infant formulas, deaths of these infants would be prevented annually. Ugh, I think it's D, I think it's D here. Okay, awesome. Let's see what the reasoning for not E was. E would pose a good argument, okay, great. But the argument for banning here rests on the difference between breast milk and formula. Whereas D comes to play, it suggests there is another variable questioning the detriment and thus the rationale. Okay, cool. So it's D. Employees at a garden center are paid a basic rate of 11 pounds per hour during the weekdays and weekday evenings and on Saturdays, they are paid at one and a half times the basic rate and on Sundays, they are paid at double. So the hours worked by the best employees last week. Which employee earned the most? Okay, Monday to Friday daytime, Monday to Friday evenings and weekends, so that's the same. And Sundays, who worked the most Sundays? This person ate, but 27 hours here. And the second most was six and six, and they worked 32 and 30. So really we're debating between this person, 32, eight and six, or 
uh, 27, 8, and 8. So 6 times 11 is 66 times 1.5 is about 99. So let's say she earned 99 extras, extra from Sundays and with Monday to Friday daytime, 32 times 11, 352, 352 plus 99 is 451, okay? And then bill 27 times 11, which is 297 plus eight Sundays, so eight times 11, 88 times 1.5 is 132. So 297 plus 132 is 429. So um, Anastasia made more. Awesome. So that was a pretty simple math question. Just make sure you have the equations right, you have the numbers right, and your mental math is on point or your handwritten math, but the math without a calculator needs to be on point for sure. The rate for the donation of organs after death in the UK Which of the following, if true, would most strengthen the argument in the passage above? Bereaved relatives find donation decisions very distressing. No. The number of voluntary organ donors is small and not increasing. That's good to improve, to strengthen the argument in the passage. Not all of the organs donated are suitable for transplant, that would weaken. There would be opposition by civil liberty groups to this measure weaken if it is not known how many people would opt out of the compulsory scheme. That would weaken, so I'm going to go with B. Awesome. Both sugar and artificial sweeteners are composed only of glucose and fructose. Which of the following is an assumption or assumptions of the underlying passage? Some effects of overconsumption of food cannot be mitigated by any other factors. It is assuming this, actually. It's assuming that leptin is the only thing that controls this. So one is an assumption. Leptin regulates the sensation of hunger. This is another assumption. One and two are kind of tied close together. Glucose has a greater impact on leptin than fructose. It doesn't really talk about the glucose effectiveness, so I'm going to go with one and two. One and two is not an option, so I'm gonna go with one, two, and three. Okay, so in that case, I knew that one and two were correct assumptions, and I didn't think that three was correct, but since the answers doesn't have a one and two option, but I still know one and two are right, I can only choose one, two, and three. You can see how even without knowing 100% of what is correct, you can still come to the correct conclusion and get the right answer. Health services should find better ways to Which one of the following best expresses the conclusions? One quarter of patients with high PSA are being wrongly treated. Not really. The most effective ways of screening for prostate cancers are needed. This is definitely true. This is the argument, I would say. Health services could save money currently spent on unnecessary diagnosed procedures. I mean, that's probably true, but it's not the core conclusion of the argument. Now, large prostate are most common. LVPC has no medical significance. It's not saying that there's no medical significance. It's just saying that it's not always the case for each individual person. So I'm definitely going to go with B. Okay, awesome. Children are being encouraged to take up cooking. Which of the following, if true, would most weaken the above argument? The practical experience of cooking is not a traditional academic subject. Not really. The events to encourage children to cook also included stands where junk food was for sale. Okay. Some schools do not have cooking facilities. It tends to be older people who are interested in cooking and making their own food. Most children have enjoyed the events provided but have not gained an interest in cooking itself. This is definitely going to weaken the argument because it's saying everything that they're trying to do isn't really working. Their whole purpose is that if we get children to take these cooking classes, they're probably going to be more interested. But if this was true, that they attended the cooking classes and they participated, but they still weren't interested, then that would definitely be weakening the argument. Okay, he is right. Awesome. Okay, guys, I think that's where I'm going to call it for today. We've done both critical thinking and problem solving questions. I hope I've been able to talk you through my thinking and my logic when answering these questions and that I've hopefully showed you how to tackle them yourself. If you guys found this useful, definitely leave a thumbs up on this video. Subscribe to my channel if you want to see more videos from me and more videos like this. I'll be making more videos on section two and section three of the BMAT exam as well. So make sure you stay tuned for those. All right, guys, I hope you've enjoyed and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.